Thank you, everybody, for joining the webinar. This is a topic that every procurement leader uh, should really think about and have in their toolkit. Uh, from my experience over time, the profession in, has changed more in the last 10 years than it did in the first 100. Uh, we are, we're in a constantly changing environment uh, where we really need leaders to take charge, adapt, and lead their organizations through transformation. You know, observers rarely make it, and they're usually forced out of their organization. And then leaders always make it. In fact, one of my clients in the uh, early 1990s in the food industry attended a workshop back at Penn State conducted by Joe Cavanato. And uh, he came back with the understanding that his, his whole team was transactional and tactical. Uh, he, he took that to the board of directors and the CEO of the company, unintimidated to say our team's not where they want to be. Here are the gaps we need to close. Here are the weaknesses that we have. And at the end of his career, he was the CEO of one of the major divisions of the company. All right, so he managed to be able to transform the business, uh, saved over $100 million in a low-margin business. Needless to say, his career turned out great. It really takes a lot of courage to look at your organization, say it's not so good, and then talk about what do you need to do to close it. And once you have that courage, you'll, uh, you'll really uh, make a lot of change. So let's get started. What, what I'm going to t talk about today is really the need of change. What's driving change? What's going to continue to drive change in the next 10, 10 years? What are the tools that you can use for benchmarking and baselining? What's a really good change process? What works and what doesn't? And then how do you approach an organization in terms of getting the uh, budget and the necessary money to make this work? Just a quick overview of where we've been. I mean, I talked about the 19... And that was really, we were focused totally on price. Price is the driver. It's going to be the thing that uh, we're always looking at, things that our management's looking at. In about 1995, we changed our, our way and we started looking at costs. So what are the cost drivers? How can we impact the cost? What are the materials, the labor, the overhead? Uh, and, and how much profit are our uh, our suppliers making? All right, so... As we start to evolve the procurement side, we went to strategic sourcing. How can we reduce SKUs? How can we uh, rationalize suppliers? How can we get better at building strategies to do this? And as we uh, uh, approach category management, let's take whole categories and manage them in cross-functional, cross-business ways that give us collaboration and continue to drive out cost. And as we move forward, it's going to all be about value because our suppliers really only have so much margin, right? And we focused on that margin for a long time. As we see consolidation in the industry, we still need healthy suppliers that are going to invest in innovation, invest in automation, and invest in helping us be leaders in our industry. So I think as we move forward, it's all going to be about capturing value. And that's going to be one of the key things. And what's going to drive change right now? Well, we're looking at a digital and mobile future. We're going to see interconnected supply chains through uh, uh, the Internet of Things. We're going to see automated purchasing systems where, you know, I, I, I talked about this not too long ago, and then I got a call uh, about automated purchasing systems where we're going to have intelligent computer systems that are going to be able to survey the entire market on the Internet, build an RFI, build an RFQ, and present recommendations. So the transactional pieces of our business will probably go away and we'll continue to get more and more speed, more and more information. We're going to see change in demographics where millennials are now 50% of the workforce. We're likely to see some contingent workforces where people come, do a, do a category strategy, and leave. We're going to continue to see uh, customers demand more value. Consequently, we've got to drive more value from the supply chain. We're going to see more and more corporate social responsibility and sustainability. We're definitely working on a global economy. And over time, I think we're going to wind up architecting and designing our supply chains to meet our business needs. And we'll wind up with exclusive tied supply chains that are competitive with each other. So that's where I think we're going to go. So when we start to think about transformation, we have to understand what do we want to change and how are we going to change it. And there are really two processes Benchmarking is a process of comparing one's business process and performance to industry leaders and, and looking at the best practice. One of the things I think is interesting about benchmarking is that some companies 
uh, some companies look at that benchmark, and what they do is they actually take the benchmark and set that as the target without understanding the underlying pro- underlying processes that make that benchmark work in a given organization. So I think getting the numbers is great, but I really like baselining, which is, for me, finding the very best practices and processes from all industries, measuring where are we to achieving this gap using the process and and the benchmark, and how can we drive ourselves to meet that best practice? So uh, someone's still got their uh, uh, phone unmuted. If you could mute it, that'd be great. Okay, moving on. You know, so I looked up what's the best way of doing benchmarking, and, and uh, uh, you select a, a subject, you define the process, you identify who are going to be the partners, look for our data source, source collect the data, determine what the gap is, determine how far are you from that gap, what are the process differences between you and the benchmark gap, and then target future performance on on moving to close that gap. And that requires communication across the business at the management level. It also sets goals that we need to implement, and we can review them from time to time and recalibrate. So those are some of the things we want to do. But one of the things we want to do is we want to look at who are the leaders in uh, in, in industry. So which, which companies are the leaders and which ones are the laggers? And, you know, the leaders have to continue to evolve to gain competitive advantage. So they're constantly evolving. They're constantly changing. Even if they're very good, they tend to do this baselining or benchmarking activity to even be better. And those companies that are the laggers are unable to uh, compete, will become extinct, and they can't can't get competitive uh, parity. So we we want to be hooked to the leaders. We want to be the leader, but that means continuous process change and continuous change of all. So, I mean, some questions that you ask when you're thinking about this is who's the best in class in procurement? The second question I would ask is, should we search inside and outside our industry? And I would say both. We want to be the very, very best best practice that we can be. And then how can we lead a transformation? So these are the questions that I hope we can answer in this uh, next 40 minutes. Okay, so what we have to do is we have to uh, look at, are we locked in by specifications? So I've worked with a few companies where they only have single sources, they have a very difficult change process, and they tend not to be competitive uh, uh, with the short, shortened life cycles that we're seeing. We always have to be adaptable. All right, so the next piece that uh, I see is people are unable to capture supply chain innovation, and we'll talk about that later in the workshop. And then the other thing is customers keep increasing their demand for value, more and more value, which forces us to use the supply chain to to generate that value. And then price has been optimized and suppliers just have sustainable margins. So we need to actually drive uh, innovation. So what drives change? Well, technology drives change. The economy drives change. Competition, innovation, and profitability all drive key changes. Any one of these factors can Im- impact not only your industry, but your need to tra- change. So where to start? Well, you can attend conferences. You can attend Zykus Horizon, the ISM conference, the SIP conference, the MSU conference, uh, and, and there's many, many others. So find, find it, kind of uh, build a network of people, look at what their practices are, listen to the practitioners tell you about success, and then arrange to meet with them uh, either in a video conference or in, a, uh, in, a, in person to see what do they do. The other way you could do it is hire a, an impartial third pro, uh, party that may have the benchmarking data you're looking for. So what do I look for? I'm going to tell you exactly what I look for when I go in and start baselining clients. I want to know, where does the organization report? Does the organization report to um, a, a operational uh, executive or does it report at the sea level? The problem I have with an operational executive is if procurement reports down in the operational level, then what happens is the urgent and necessary become the thing that takes over and the operation will drive procurement rather than procurement driving uh, strategic solutions and costs. So where, where does it report is one of the key things. 
what is the focus? If the focus is, you know, making sure that we have enough delivery, en- enough material to deliver, then that's a serious issue. So, you know, where is it focused? Is it looking at a three-year plan? Does it have a, a, a short-term plan, which would be one year, a medium-term plan, which is two, and for me, a long-term plan, which is three? And are we planning those things simultaneously? The other focus is, have we separated the strategic needs from the uh, tactical and transactional needs? You know, if we have lots of competition in the the marketplace, then we'll use competition to drive that marketplace. But if it's strategic, we're going to have to find solutions that give us competitive advantage. I also sit down with the management team and I ask, what performance do you expect? And then I'll sit down with the individuals in the the procurement side and ask what, what is expected of them. And I would say in 90% of the baselines that I've done, there's not a match. So what the, or what the management and senior management is expecting is one thing, and what the people are perceiving is expected is another. So they're not really, they're not really in sync. The other thing I ask is, what's the performance uh, that, that's, that you have to deliver, and how are you measured? And typically, the measurements are not very, very um, specific and mostly around price price. The other thing is, how are you funded? Or how do you fund projects? How do you do, you know, do you, do you have a funds that you can bring in samples from other people or travel to suppliers? And are you funded right? Are you sufficiently staffed? Sometimes I've seen people not sufficiently staffed and other times overstaffed. You know, so how are you represented in the C-suite? Do you have access to the C-suite? Are you on the C-suite? are some of the things I'd look for. And then what's the talent management strategy you have in your organization? How do you bring in new talent? How do you keep talent? And is there an adequate succession plan? And most generally, there's not a real good succession plan and there's not a real good opportunity um, um, for people to you know, gain talent, rotate, get on rotational programs, work through different departments. So those are things I'd look for as well. And then this is a critical question I have to ask is who has the responsibility, the authority, and the accountability for purchasing? It, not too long ago, I was working with a big company in the mining industry, actually in the mining industry, and the uh, um, chief purchasing officer had uh, – responsibility for the strategy and accountability for making it work, yet all of the purchasing folks um, reported through to operations. So even if that person had the best strategy in the world, he didn't have the authority to make it work. And a new CEO came in, basically told the guy, your your cost reductions are anemic, and uh, we we went back with a plan that said if in fact I have the responsibility, the accountability, and the authority, we can generate two hundred million dollars. And that CEO uh, looked at that, uh, granted the the guy the opportunity to first in the first six months show twenty million, and then in over two more years two hundred million. And the guy now is the ver- uh, the uh, uh, executive vice president, senior um, senior supply chain officer. So that's a p- critical point I look for. And then I look at what contribution is expected from procurement. How how has it performed over the last three four years? Is there funding to travel? You'd be surprised how many companies don't have uh, opportunities for people to travel. And at what level of what does procure, procure, procurement have over the spend? And when I look at that, I look at not only the uh, direct side, but I look at the indirect side as well. So I think uh, I think that that's pretty important to understand. Um, And then then you know what level what what uh, um, how do they analyze the expenditure? How do they know what to go after? How do they organize and influence the organization? So when I'm looking at companies, these are some of the criteria that I use. I also uh, I want to look at, is there a proper cost management program? Do people have a plan for uh, cost cost improvement, uh, cost um, containment, and cash production? So what is the plan, and how does that plan work? And do you have detailed models for the cost side? You can't really be a good purchasing person unless you understand what things cost, you understand the dynamics, you understand... Um, the market, and you understand the margins that suppliers are operating within that mar- market. So I look at that as well. I also look is is there a formal process to generate value? Do you have a formal process to bring in innovation? 
Are you tagged with bringing in innovation? Have you designed leanness in the supply chain? You know, how are you managing supplier relationship management over time? You know, it's kind of interesting. We put in contracts, and then there's one, one of three ways they can go. You know, if we don't put any more attention into them, they drift along, or they can decline. Certainly, the supplier can, can uh, decline in performance, or we can put in a proper supplier relationship management program and drive that, drive that supplier to the to new new heights. So uh, that's some of the things I ask. And then, what's the risk management strategy? Most people I ask, how do you have a risk management strategy? And I'll do a lot of speaking about risk management. And in a group of 300, everybody raises their hand. And then when I ask, how far have you mapped the supply chain, and does your uh, risk management program go through tier one, tier two, and tier three suppliers, everybody drops their hand. So really, you know, do you have a predictive model? Do you know where the risk is in your supply chain, or are you just looking at financial risk? And that's something I would look for in a, in a good purchasing department. And then again, um, do you have good talent development plans for your team. You know, what's the formal strat strategy? I already talked about a three-year category strategy, but I would also expect to see where are you going to drive this organization? Where is it now? And where will it be three years from now? And then is it endorsed by senior management, funded, and is there a champion for the plan? Those are the key pieces I'd look for. I'd also look at a systems review. So do you have good systems? Are they, do they give you the source to pay side? Do they give you the data that you're looking for? Do you have e-catalogs, e-procurement, uh, auction capabilities, and does the system enable SRM? You know, those are some of the things I look for. So I'm looking for um, organization. How well is it? How well is it designed and how well is it performing? I'm looking for processes. Uh, do you have all the processes in place or most of the processes in place for good, good uh, purchasing performance? And I'm looking at systems. Does it support all the needs that you have? And, you know, so when you start to look at how do I make this transformation, it's a pretty intimidating process, right? It, there's a lot of data. There's a lot of errors. You may have gaps everywhere. And one of the things you've got to realize is that you can't close all the gaps at once. So if I'm looking at with a, working with a company over a transformational project, you know, I used to be embarrassed to say it'll take a year and a half or two years to implement this project. Uh, but I learned with my very first client, which is in the pharmaceutical area, that we made the transformation in organization, process, systems, and, and people – uh, with training and development and some additional, um, that particular company saved over $400 million on a billion-dollar spend in just a year and a half. And then they were asked to take on the global procurement and all the indirect procurement, and that company continued to drive after the baseline. So those are really good, good intimidating results, but you can't close all the gaps at once. So one of the things you need to do is determine which is the most critical gap we have and then how can we impact that gap and make that change? So those are some of the things that, that I think are important. To get through the maze, you really got to do what I said. You've got to profile the gaps, quanti quantify any of the issues, quantify a development plan, build the financial analysis on what's going to give you the biggest return, build the processes you need, and present the business case to management. <clears throat> I often talk to people about how they present the business case. And really, from my perspective, there's really only a, a – well, senior management only wants to know three things. What's it cost? What's the return on investment? What's the risk? All right, and how long will it take? Four things. All right, so if you can present those findings in terms of return for, for investment, you'll probably be okay. Most people are intimidated about saying we have these gaps. But, I mean, leaders aren't. Leaders move forward, identify the gaps, come up with a plan to close them, present that to management, get endorsement, and then make the changes they need. All right, so when we're looking at how do we, how do we look at an opportunity, we've got to look at those areas for cost improvement, supplier rationalization, maybe SQ, S, SKU reduction. Uh, you're looking at complexity reduction. Complexity reduction costs you a lot of money. So you really got to you really got to understand how much that stuff costs. So, you know, are you trying to reduce the complexity? Are you trying to improve your pay uh process? 
category savings, direct direct savings, all these things are part of the opportunity, and they all have to be brought together. Some opportunity, some some things you need to change won't present a financial opportunity. If in fact you've got an archaic uh, system and you need to move forward with a new one, it's not going to result in in head cap. And a head count reduction is likely to result in complexity redu- reduction and give you a compar- competitive parity. And you're held at competitive disadvantage by not being able to um, use e-procurement or drive results. So there's lots of ways you can do the opportunity analysis. You know, I look if it's a specialized product, if it's specification driven, stakeholder preference are all key things. I try to develop how much competition is out there. So if it's got lots of competition, um, it probably has more of an opportunity to, to, to be uh, a reduction. I also look at, can is there any way that we can impact the specification or make a change or work with the technical people on a truly strategic item? And those those things generate an opportunity that we can uh, quantify. So what we're trying to do is race ahead of the rest. So we really want to... Um, build a cost-benefit relationship for change, really financially driven. Uh, So everything we do is going to save us money. Complexity reduction, value improvement, cost improvement, uh, leaning the supply chain, inventory improvement, everything we do will probably impact it. It's just we have to pick the priorities. We have to time activities over a period of time, like I told you, and we have to position low organization resistance first so that we make these big wins, and then once you make the wins, in quick wins, you get credibility, and you get the management behind you. Sometimes you start with a skeptical management, and that moves on. And you have to engage your stakeholders in the process. As you start to gain credibility and results, the stakeholders align with you. All right. Yeah. So need a kind of a business case. This is kind of an example where one of the things we're showing is advantages, disadvantage, benefits from the thing, risks. Like I said, we want to show our management what it costs, what will be the benefits, what's the risk, how long will it take. That's what they want to know. So that's pretty much the process that I use when I'm looking at a company for transformational change. Now, which road will you take? Some of the things that make initiatives fail are, you know, what level of management support is engaged? If you don't have a lot of management support um, and you get skeptical stakeholders, you really have a hard way to go, and you have to start with those those little wins so that you keep accumulating little wins. And that, the pharmaceutical example I gave you, $400 million, was a bit like that, that the management wasn't engaged until the money started rolling in. You know, we, pro- we projected a savings of 4 or $12 million and wound up with, I want to say, almost $100 million the first year. So once we hit that, then the management team became very engaged. They took ownership of the pro- program. And I've seen that in many, many transformations changes, where the skepticism is first, we deliver the results, and then management takes over that program, and they want to accelerate it much faster than we're able to. We want to make it easy for managers to buy in. We want to be able to communicate. We want to make sure we get a project funded. And I think and I think you have to fund any any project like this. One of the one of the things uh, where I see where I see fail is if you're bringing, bringing in people people from a local location, location or you're bringing in bringing other other location, 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 you always have the operational national managers who are going to pay for this. And then then them um, participate. So I think so I think you really need really need a budget change or change program endorsed by endorsed by management. Exactly exactly what we're going to do. How are we going to do it? I think black and black leadership, you can't can't lead a program, you can't manage 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 a a very very, uh, extensive extensive, uh, project project with multiple multiple layers, 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 divisions, and you can't can't really influence people in the organization, organization. Uh, then you won't be successful. All right. So we want to. We really want to create a compelling case for change. Uh, if someone supports and doesn't want to play, that's fine. Because as you start to build momentum and get improvement in other areas, they either have to join the join the party or exit exit the party. So I think that that's an important piece. Uh, uh, and one of the initiatives I had. Uh, 
it was really interesting because the IT people didn't want to do anything with uh, with the procurement group. So, you know, we had a target of five million. Said you own the target, you deliver the target. Life is good. Next year, the target increased, and over time, they decided they didn't like they didn't like having to be accountable for that project. And then they invited in the procurement team, but it took a couple of years for them to buy in. So set the appropriate level of management in the business case. Make sure that you have, you know, champions across our organization. And and I'm okay with leaving someone out because eventually if you have the success in other areas, then they're going to be brought in by default. If you don't have the right focus and you've got too many competing pro- projects in, in the company and you have conflicting messages for management, you're going to fail. And so you really want a clear, compelling business case. You really want clear management support. You want communication, you want to identify your stakeholders. Who's really uh, proactive? Who's going to be a champion? Who's a cynic? Who's sitting on the fence to see what you do? And and have a well-thought-out implementation plan. That's some of the reasons some of these initiatives fail. And energy, you have to energize the organization. You know, and uh, uh, so I I I, uh, I like to see the CEO write an initial letter and and work with us, work with the supply base, work with everybody to make that work, and bring them in on the team. The best example of a, a change program I had is when the CEO brought in all his division presidents. He was actually the chairman. Brought all his division chairmen in, uh, division presidents in, and they were accountable to sponsor one of the projects. So uh, that particular initiative generated in a low-cost business, over $40 million in two years. But everybody was accountable, and you know, R&D had to support the other division presidents, and they had to support everybody else, so it became a, a team effort. So get engagement as soon as you can. You're going to see resistance in a change program. People naturally resist change, um, uh, so they tend to – you have to look at what can eliminate it, and what eliminates it really is – to get the supporters to sing your praise and then get the fence sitters to come over. Some people resist change and resistors. I've never seen a a heavy duty resistor uh, stay with the business after after a change program is initiated, probably because they're out of sync with the culture over time. All right. So again, you you want to over present a good case, develop a good strategy, overcome the resistance and, you know, You'll you'll you move with the with the with the business. Once you create the train, the train starts moving. Resistors either have to get on the train or totally get off. And then I think if you don't have the right knowledge, uh, change is painful. People don't like change, but uh, people you know generally will buy in if you're starting to get the kinds of success. So understand who's going to sabotage you, what it's going to do. I like to have stakeholder maps, and I like to map the stakeholders. So people really respond favorable to objective data that's logically presented, and uh, you know they just uh, just just fall in line. If you don't have a good process, you're going to fail. All right, you can't communicate too much, and uh, you know the solution is to make sure you have a project plan that works. You be sure you adapt that project plan as you go along because you always hit roadblocks, and you'll have to do it. I like to have a steering committee of senior executives to oversee. I don't pester them to death. I probably have once a month, but their job is to remove those roadblocks and help the initiatives move forward. If, in fact, you combine the steering committee with the quick wins, you can't help but have a good change process. Right? If you don't have a good strategy, one of the things you have to do is really be clear and effective uh, and understand how it's going to work. And I think that that's a critical piece. And you have to understand there's four phases of change. People deny the change, they resist the change, then they explore the change, and then they commit to the change. And you're going to see that in any change program you drive forward. So I think that's a, that's a key point. Uh, and then, you know, our our role is to help people overcome exi- resistance. Our role is to understand the four uh, phases of change. Our role is to communicate, have a good plan, get management endorsement, have a clear focus, know what we're going to change and how we're going to change it, and then um, develop a carefully region case for change. Now, one of the companies I worked with it happened to be a bakery, and uh, they had they had a monthly newsletter called The Dough Keeps Rising. And that was uh, an interesting newsletter. Everybody on the on the company, including people on the uh, on the opera in the operations on the on the line, 
got an email copy of the Doe is Rising. It became a culture in the business, and the target that was set was achieved a year early. And so they had they named the target by the savings, and within a year they had to change the name of the program because it was uh, uh, already already received. So um, that's another thing that you might want to think about. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to align our executives. We're trying to align, align the finance folks and get the kind of endorsement we want, align all stakeholders, and really drive ourselves to world-class performance. It's going to take world-class procurement performance. It's going to take a while if you do it right. It'll probably take you a year to two to make all the changes and maybe even more. But once you make the change, um, it doesn't end. It's a continuous program, and you're continuously going to change because the world's changing uh, far faster than, than we're keeping up. So um, the, the gap analysis and transformation will get you to a new point, but then you really have to have a good process to continue to change as the environment changes with you. So the world's changing quickly. Best practice is old news. All right? What happened yesterday, as you saw in my evolution chart, you know, you can't be stuck in category management, price management, or cost management. You've got to be moving along to the value management. You've got to be trying to architect and design a supply chain and supplier network that's going to treat you in the future. Uh, you can create a detailed analysis of where you are. You can baseline your current state. You can identify what the quantum of the gap is to best practice. And you can build a process to drive yourself to the next level. I think, again, I'll mention this, is benchmarking is great, but if you're going to benchmark, don't just look at the numbers. Look at the processes that people went through to get to those numbers because benchmarks aren't any good unless you understand how they got there and how they created those benchmarks. They may not be good for you. So I think uh, that's why I choose to baseline um, my products and, and my, my clients so that I can tell them, here's where you are, here's where best practice is, here's what you need to do, on every aspect to get there, on the organization, on the on the process, systems, and people. And people need development. They need new skill sets. We need to bring in new people in some cases. We need to align the organization. We need to move our organization so that we're really focused on the strategic areas and know where we're going to go. And we need to convince our management we're in control. So with that, any questions? Yeah. Thank you, Bill. I think uh, it was a very insightful uh, session. And uh, before we get into questions, uh, uh, I would like to really thank the audience uh, for bearing with us. Uh, there were some audio issues uh, in between. Uh, uh, so uh, thank you for bearing with us and staying on. Uh, and there are some interesting questions, Bill, uh, uh, which have come your way. And uh, one of them uh, is actually asking, from your experience of uh, you know dealing with a lot of organizations on change management aspect, how long uh, does a transformational change usually take, uh, you know, to kind of fructify? I talked a little bit about this. I think it, it depends on on the quantum of the gap and which gaps you're trying to close. One of the things I think that's important is that you identify what can you do in a reasonable time frame. So when you have, it's like that in the training and development side too. It's you know what gaps do you want to close, and then uh, I would focus really on no more than. Um, four or five gaps. So if talent management is a gap, if your organization structure is a gap, uh, you know, it's going to take you at least a year to get the processes right, the organization realigned, uh, buy-in from the management, uh, opportunities defined, and then capture the quick hits. So there's really two pieces to it. One, you have to uh, really work with the competitive leverage market where you have lots of suppliers and the market's driving the price. And while you're planning on how you're going to deal with um, a sole source or, or a uh, uh, preferred supplier, uh, stakeholder preferred supplier. So while you're planning those things, you need to get the quick wins at the bottom. And so one year you're actually driving the uh, you know, quick hits and the second year you're living off the strategic changes. And then once you get the strategic changes, you're going. So I say it's going to take you from one to two years to get a full transformational project done. Great. I think I think that answers the question pretty well. Uh, this another one, you know, and this this is mainly from a perspective of how do you best what is the best way to influence senior management? Well, that's that's a good question. You know, I talked about what they're looking for. They're looking for a um, uh, 
uh, what's the cost, what's the return, and what's the risk. The problem, the problem that I see in a lot of senior management is they don't they they don't believe uh, that they don't believe that we have the credibility. So I think the one thing to do is outline the program. The other thing to do is really back back a financial. Um, opportunity analysis that you can identify you can show them where the the opportunity is going to come from you can when when you actually do your presentation to management you should really focus on the opportunity analysis and make sure that you can show them uh, credibly that if we do this this and this then the result is going to be improved cost or more value or innovation if you can't if you can't quantify it in financial terms you're you're not going to do very well so i think you know Speaking the financial language, using all of your financial skills to be able to drive a, a presentation. I, you know, this is a little bit off topic, but you know, we did a risk management program once for a company, and uh, we did a predictive model over which suppliers are going to pop out as the biggest risk. And uh, in that, we use future value. So we said, here's all your products. Uh, here. Here, if, if you make this decision today, uh, you'll r- avoid this much risk in the future. And it was uh, it was a company that um, uh, had a, uh, uh, a two hundred fifty million dollars spend generating uh, almost uh, seven billion. Uh, so that that uh, the program cost them a hundred million dollars, and it would avoid uh, several. S- several billion in risk in the future and they made that decision before the board meeting ended so having to put things in financial terms show management credibly what they're going to get use uh, use your finance department to help you build that, that structure if you can if, if you're capable of doing it yourself do it but you got to look at you know what's the future value of money what's the present value what's the opportunity and how are you going to capture that opportunity and i think uh uh, with the right model, you can probably do it. Now, you know, a lot of people say uh, consultants are a good good source. Well, you can do it yourself. It just takes a little bit longer, and you got to go through a trial and error process. Whereas uh, an external person may have the models already to slug the the things in. So, uh, either way, it works. Great. Great. Uh, there's there's one more, and you know, this is interesting. I think Bill, you also spoke about uh, you know organizations not having budget for their change management. So. The question here is, you know, uh, why do you need a budget for a change management program? Well, I mean, I think uh, I think it's uh, critical because again, you get all these internal disputes over who's paying for what, and when those disputes go away, you're able to. I mean, one of the one of the hardest pieces is you're gonna you're gonna use resources from other parts of the organization. So you're likely to use some stakeholder resources, some engineering resources, some R&D resources, and uh, well, you really don't want the, the issue of I can't, I can't give you the resource because it's going to come out of my budget. So I think you really have to understand what it's going to cost, and it has to be part of your analysis because you're probably going to visit cross-functional teams. You're probably going to bring in people for an overall launch meeting. You're probably going to bring people in for development, and you're probably going to do uh, teleconferences to make sure that all the projects are on track and that everything's moving the way you need to. So I think you're you you automatically fail if you get into that. Who's paying for the trip? Who's paying for the travel? Why do I have to participate? That all goes away if you build a budget and you build the process and you get the management endorsement. Well, great. I think I think that 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 was uh, you know uh, what probably these uh, the attendee was looking at. And uh, with that, probably you know, uh, you know, I, I see uh, no more questions at at my end. Uh, okay. A lot of questions uh, who which have come in terms of uh, you know would we be sharing the webinar slides? So, uh, yes, uh, we would be sharing the webinar slides, and uh, we would also be sharing uh, the recorded the link to the recorded uh, session of this webinar uh, to all the attendees and uh, those who had registered for the event. So with that, uh, uh, we would like to conclude our webinar today. Uh, in case you have more questions, uh, you you are free to send us your questions uh, to either uh, Bill or myself uh, uh, on the email IDs provided on the screen. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed today's webcast, and we look forward to hosting you in our future events. Once again, thank you, everyone, and have a nice day. Thank you.